Hello, everyone. So I'm Catherine de Wolf. I'm Assistant Professor of Circular Engineering for Architecture at ETH Zurich. And it's really my pleasure to be here today and to introduce those amazing speakers. So our session is called Behind the Curtain, the Creative Role of the Structural Engineer and the Architect in the 21st Century. That's such a long title. So I think what this session is about is really about the future of civil engineers and architects um, and really what the new generations should be looking into. Uh, so I would also encourage the, the younger audience also to ask more questions as well in this discussion. All right, so the first speaker will be, I think we have an image of the speakers here. It's not in the right order, but the first speaker will be Lee Frank. And Lee Frank is a structural engineer who graduated from EPFL in 2009. She worked for Arab in London, focusing on the design of cultural projects in close collaboration with architects and for Gene Orderson and Associates in New York City, a structural engineering firm employing both engineers and architects. And they have also a, a focus on creative conceptual design. She has been a regular guest lecturer at universities such as Princeton, Columbia, the Bartlett and the Architectural Association, teaching structural fundamentals to architects and conceptual design to engineers. She is the founder of the Future of Design Conference in London and New York City, promoting innovation and collaboration with the construction industry in 2012, she was awarded the Rising Star Award by the Royal Academy of Engineering. And in 2014, she was awarded the Structural Award by the Institution of Structural Engineers. She now works as an independent consultant in Luxembourg, advising clients in the early stages of their projects with a focus on sustainable design thinking. Please join me in welcoming Lee Frank. Um, thank you, Catherine. Um, so when I was asked to come and speak at this conference, um, it wasn't so hard to choose what I really wanted to talk about. Um, I think there's one topic that's clearly very close to my heart, but I think it's also a really big concern to all the younger engineers uh, in this room or, or generally in the profession. So I really want to talk about the climate emergency. And I'm glad that we already talked about it during this conference, but I, I think I want to go maybe a little bit deeper and really look at what our role as structural engineers is in all of this problem that we're facing. So I'm just going to set the context. This is going to be nothing new to, to most of you, I'm sure. But we know, so scientists agree, if you reach uh, one and a half uh, degree warming, there will be far reaching consequences. We talk about the runaway climate. And today, we are already at this one degree warming. So if we keep on going uh, in the same way we have been so far, somewhere around 2040, we will already have reached this tipping point. And we all know what this means, right? We can feel it now. I mean, in Luxembourg, where I work, there has been a lot of flooding in Germany as well. There's wildfires, there's sea level risings, and so on. And I think if we all felt that this time during COVID now has been super disruptive to our lives, I think what lies ahead of us, if we don't meet this challenge, is just going to be so much more disruptive than what we've experienced so far. But, you know, this is not all dark and gloomy. And yes, it's true that all of these climate conferences that we had so far have actually produced very, very little change. But the good news is we still have time to turn this around. And we know the target. It's... Um, net zero carbon by 2050 with reductions as we go along. So you might all say this is nice and good, but what does this really mean to me as a structural engineer? And this is something I like to share because it wasn't so clear to me until two or three years ago, but the construction industry is actually responsible for 40% of energy related carbon emissions worldwide, 40%. And if we now zoom further into this, you know, well, a lot of the discussion has always been about embodied carbon, oh, sorry, about operational carbon. This is what our sustainability assessment methods are based on. But actually with the decarbonization of the grid and the um, higher performance of our MLP systems, the big focus now is in the embodied carbon. So the stuff that we're responsible for. And if we look at the building uh, and we look only at the embodied carbon, Two thirds of this we find in the super and substructure and in some construction related activities. So this is really our job as structural engineers. 
And if I take this whole picture together, you know, we come to the conclusion that somewhat as professionals, as structural engineers, we're responsible for 10% of these carbon emissions worldwide. And this is not a blame game. This is not to say, okay, we're, we're like really to, to, to blame here, but it's also a great opportunity that our impact can be significant. And I always like to hone this in with, with more of a practical example and something tangible with numbers. And to put it things into context, say, um, if you decide not to take this plane over the Atlantic, you save one ton of carbon. Now let's look at a practical example. You're an engineer, you design a building um, with an embodied carbon, an average embodied carbon. You, ha you have responsibility for 5,000 tons of CO2. Now, if you just try and be 20% better, which we know we can be, you will save a thousand tons of carbon. This is like, um, like kind of convincing a thousands of your friends not to take a plane. So I think the, the big lesson here or the, the big kind of point I wanna make is these lifestyle changes that we all have to make are really good. But as professionals, we can have a so much bigger influence than what we do in our lives. Now, I think the next step is then to look at what can we actually do in our design? And this is some work. I started doing this with, with a colleague, David Knight, and we presented on this two years at the conference. And since then, a lot of work has been done also by the Institution of Structural Engineers. And what I'm sharing here with you is like a condensed version of, of that, that guidance that is out there. So, and the first thing I think we have to realize when we look at the lifetime of a, pro of a project, it's in these early phases of the design that we can have the biggest influence on the carbon. And this is why I think it's so important we talk about this here today, because this is about conceptual design. Now, going into these kind of um, steps in a little bit more detail, we already talked about it. I mean, it might sound difficult to accept this, but we just have to sometimes build nothing. In our developed world, we have a really big uh, existing building stock, we cannot demolish anymore. We have to find ways to reuse. And if we cannot reuse everything, can we go through this step-by-step? Step? Can we repurpose? Can we refurbish? Can we maybe just reuse the foundations? And then if we, uh, if we look at this and if we cannot reuse it this time, can we build in circular uh, design uh, principles so that maybe we can do it the next time? And then the next category, which, of course, I mean, I'm very excited about this one because that's where our engineering um, ingenuity really comes in. How can, be, how can we be more clever about things? We already talked about it today. This is um, a list which is more appropriate to building design. And I do really believe that reducing spans overall, even if you take into account foundations, is a way to go. Can we work with our architects to be clever about the space planning and, and work at these grids so we get rid of transfer structure? They're hugely, hugely impactful when it comes to CO2. Um, the use of efficient structural forms, there were some great examples given at this, this conference, but it doesn't even have to be new stuff. We know flat slabs are really bad. Can we make ripped slabs? Can we use voided slabs? And so on. Um, low carbon materials, of course, timber, but only if it's specified properly. And of course, there's other solutions. Reducing the loads, such an easy gain. We design for loads in office building two and a half, three kPa. And in reality, we know that loads rarely get over 1.5. So I'm not saying let's go right to that, that bottom limit, but can we, can we really question what we design for and reducing as well these design criteria where it's relevant. Building efficiently, uh, utilization criteria is really big one. A recent study in steel design showed that as engineers, we, on average, our structures are utilized to 50%. You know, can we push things harder? Should we not just design for maximum utilization criteria, but maybe even also a minimum? And then of course, let's review these specifications. We need to specify cement replacement and there's many more measures we need to do, reducing waste and of course also sourcing locally. You know, I'm just sharing this because, of course, not every project will need all of these steps and not everything will be relevant because it, depend, it depends on the context. But I think it's a good map that we can follow through to really try and make things more efficient. And then maybe going beyond that, of course, there's the project work, but there's also kind of a bigger uh, picture we need to see here. I think one of the main messages I hope to convey is that let's really own this carbon agenda. Um, we know we play a really big role in this. And I think often we tend to say, well, the client didn't ask for it or the architect didn't letters, or it's not, let the not yet the legislation. 
but we can really drive this bottom up now. So when it becomes legislation, we're really well prepared for, for all of this. And of course, we need to do it quickly. We see we still have time, but we have to do it now. We have to aim for 10% reduction in the CO2 footprint every single year. Getting informed is important. You know, I, I didn't learn this at university. I had to catch up on this in the years afterwards, which was normal because it didn't really, the methods weren't established, but can this really be part of the curriculum at university as well? So we know what we have to do. And then benchmarking, you know, we say we have to get better, but I don't even, I didn't even know what the average embodied carbon of the projects I have been designing uh, has been. So let's first look at where we are now. And then every year we can set a new target, we can measure it, and then we can also share with each other, you know, what were the steps that, that we had to do to get there. A really important one, and we talked about it briefly as well, is how do we make the business case? How do we convince our clients that they should actually be doing this? And I do really believe that there's a shift. I think people are starting to ask for this, especially the younger generation. They want to live in houses that are more sustainable. They want to uh, work in offices and for firms that take this really seriously. And we can help those employers to, to give them the data to really say, you know, your building is more sustainable, but not just greenwashing, but with real facts. And then the last point I want to make, and, and I hope this can become a discussion also with the young engineers in the room and with the panelists, how do we keep on attracting the talent into our industry? Um, I think it's not a news that we have a shortage of engineers. I personally, through my career, I had friends, really good engineers. They decided to leave the industry and go and work uh, in some other career. And the question is, why is this happening? And, and I think one thing to realize is the generational shift you know engineers used to be maybe baby boomers and generation y and the importance was there more on job security salaries maybe prestige but i think my generation is looking for something very different and i think the next generation even more and to summarize it i think it's purpose we want to do a job where we feel that we can have a positive impact we want to have meaning in our work when I put these two together and I look at this amazing opportunity we have for the moment with the climate crisis and this desire to, impact, to do impactful work, can we not put these two more together and like really attract um, the talent into our industry? Thanks. Great, thank you very much for this talk. Um, this really echoes also a lot of the, the, the feedback I get from my students also. Um, I see a, a question over there. And there is a mic coming your way. Thank you. I love your, uh, your talk, Lee. Uh, I have two things to say. I, I think that uh, carbon should be taken in consideration like health and safety. So we have Eric to, to take control of the health and safety. So we should eliminate, reduce, inform and control. And the same applies to carbon. And when we do changes in the initial design, we should track those, those changes that we are doing during the process of the, of, the, of the project in the same way that we do with health and safety. And the second thing is, it's very important to measure is like, when you go on a diet and you think that some food is going to be bad, that it's going to have a lot of calories and you think some food is good. And then when you start tracking what, uh, how many calories they actually have, you see that you were wrong. So the same applies to the materials. And that is something that uh, Professor Tully, uh, 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 well, before, uh, they said about uh, what at the beginning of a material people say, no, this material is better. This is this is super ecological. And until you start tracking how many carbon it has, so people should start measuring in all the stages of the project. This is that. Yes, I, I agree with you, and I think. Uh... Um, we can do these numbers, you know, it's, it, this is actually not very difficult stuff compared to all the other engineering tasks that we do on a regular basis. Uh, this is literally mass times factors, you know, and uh, yes, there are still a lot of uncertainties about a lot of these things and whatever carbon factors we're using uh, depend on one country to another on the grid and, and you know, it's not a, an exact science, but I, I really think 
maybe the same as you say with calories, it's, it's not about getting it 100% right at this point. It's about starting doing it. And if we all start doing it, then we get much better at it. And we have this time issue that we really have to do it. Uh, thank you for your talk. Isn't there a slight tension between the idea of not building or reusing and then, for instance, decreasing loads on structures? Because we don't know what the future will offer. And if it's to tear down in 30 years something that was built a bit too cheaply, is that the right solution? Yeah, I think this is a question that has already come up a few times now in, in, these past, in the past day, which is this slight, like the conflict we perceive in terms of longevity and in terms of lean design. I mean, I can give you my personal answer to, it, to this. I, I think one thing to keep in mind is the time. You know, I, I think carbon that we spend today to put in our structures, it's gone, you know, it's out there, it's released and we cannot get it back. So if there is the decision to make whether I should design my structure for more load today instead of having to reinforce it in the future, I'm going to choose to design it leaner today because it's today that we don't have that carbon to spare. And studies have been made as well that if you compare reinforcing a structure in the future just for that specific load increase in that specific area that you needed, instead of putting a whole blanket of additional load over all of your floor area today, this also reinf like reinforcing later always comes out as less carbon. So that's my take on, on that question. Great, thank you, thank you. I, I will take one more question and, uh, and we'll keep some of your questions also for the debate later on as well afterwards. Sure, thank you, Catherine. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Ariane Roth from Laboratory of Timber Construction at uh, EPFL. I have a question for you, according to your experience and knowledge, is timber a sustainable construction material? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure there's also people in this room who, who are doing research into this. So I'm not the absolute timber specialist, but it's, I don't think there is just, you cannot just say timber is sustainable. I think it comes down to two things. It comes down to the sequestration. So when we source timber, we have to make sure that that wood gets replanted so that the carbon keeps on getting taken out of the atmosphere as long as that wood is in our buildings or structures in general. And then it also comes a lot down to what we do with the timber at the end of the life. If we burn that timber, well, then the CO2 just gets released again into the atmosphere. So overall, uh, we're not coming out as quite so good as we, we think. So to me, timber, yes, if specified, sourced, and thought about what happens at the end correctly. And then, of course, the weight gain that we get from there and the impact on the other parts of our structure, of course, the foundations, which is the second biggest source of, of CO2. I do think it's definitely an option that we should study in all of our projects and also teach at an equal level at, at university. I, for example, didn't do that. And I think throughout my professional career, it's there's always been a slight resistance to actually put that option back up. Uh, Put that option into the game as well so i think it has to get put at a par with with steel and, and concrete in, in all of our designs yeah the, the reason i ask this question is i well i'm a structural engineer but work with timber for a couple of years i can say from timber engineering perspective and point of view relaxing sls that was actually one of your one of your alternatives it's uh, uh, i don't agree i don't think that would be a, that would be a good solution to relaxing and serviceability limited state as far as timber is concerned however i i absolutely support relaxing ULS limited states and that would be something that should be considered uh, sh should be con uh, should be taken into consideration but relaxing sls i don't think so this is just a maybe professional point of view and uh, personal comment, right? But anyway, thank you for your... Sure. Thank you for your intervention. And I think um, this, this question comes up a lot and, and the answer is really, it depends. Uh, I think if I could summarize a bit what Lee just said. Um, our next speaker is joining us virtually. Uh, it's uh, Jane Wernick. She is a structural engineer practitioner. She likes to work on projects that give delight. At Arup, since 1973, she's also, uh, she also ran the Los Angeles office of Arup for two years. 
You might know her famous Arab project, The Millennium Wheel. Uh, in 1998, she founded Jane Warnick Associates, or GWA, and uh, her projects include Young Vic Theater, the treetop walkway at Kew Gardens, and the Living Architecture Houses. In 2015, GWA was incorporated into Engineers HRW, where she's now a consultant. Jane has also taught at many architecture and engineering schools. She won the 2013 CBI First Woman of the Built Environment Award. She's a member of various design review panels and think tanks such as The Edge. She edited the Reba Building Futures book, Building Happiness, Architecture to Make You Smile. So um, I tried to share my screen. Okay, uh, slide show. Okay, so um, I hope you can see this. Can you see this screen? Can you see the screen? Yes, we, we can see your screen. Okay, great. All right. So good afternoon and thank you very much for inviting me to make this contribution to such an interesting symposium. A lot of what I have to say will be um, completely in line with what Lee was talking about. Um, so I've been fortunate, I've had a great deal of fun, uh, mostly as a practitioner structural engineer over the last, last 45 years, working with some brilliant engineers and architects. But now I increasingly find that my main concern is how can we work responsibly as built environment practitioners without stoking the flames of the climate crisis. We need to collaborate as never before, not just with other designers and scientists, but also with our clients, the planners, economists, those who manage risk and provide insurance. In fact, with everyone, all of the stakeholders. I'm a member of the UK multidisciplinary built environment think tank called The Edge, which aims to encourage all the UK professional institutions to collaborate, there's 37 of them. One of our tasks has been to help our construction industry council to set out a climate action plan that each of the institutions can contribute to. We also help a brilliant organization called Letty, which is a group of more than a thousand young professionals to produce detailed and practical guidance on how we work towards net zero. This one page primer on whole life carbon is an example of the work that Letty is doing. One of the most difficult issues is that however clever we are at designing efficiently, it really isn't possible to build or even retrofit anything without producing at least some carbon. In the edge, we are currently focusing on one of the trickiest topics. Is it possible to produce cement with zero carbon emissions? Concrete is the second most consumed material after water. And although we can try to use less concrete, it seems pretty unlikely that we will stop using it entirely. So cement needs to decarbonize. And we're not talking net zero, which allows emitters to pay others to undo their damage through offsetting. We want to focus on absolute zero and encourage the development of materials production that avoids emitting any greenhouse gases in the first place. We're just at the beginning of trying to bring together the right players to seriously address this. We need to also tell our clients about the cli climate consequences of their decisions about what they want to build. I'm just gonna to mention tall buildings today. There's many issues, many other types of things we could be talking about. They can be seen as a symbol of success and prosperity but they also have more embodied energy and more energy in use than lower buildings per usable square meter. Yes, we're constantly improving our techniques for making buildings that consume less energy and have a lower carbon footprint, but we should compare the best tall buildings with the best lower ones. We're often told that we have to build tall because we don't have enough land, but there have been many studies to show that lower cities can be as dense as high cities. The French architect and planner Serge Sala showed that an eight to 10 story city like old Paris inside the Peripherique has a similar density to modern Shanghai. Philip Stedman at UC University College London and others have, show, have also shown that it's possible to create high densities using six to eight stories. The other big change we need to make is our attitude to how long a construction should last. New buildings and structures need to be designed to last forever 
with, with the right maintenance. They should be capable of multiple uses. They should be able to be modified. As a rule, we should modify existing buildings rather than demolishing or replacing them. A new building or bridge should be seen as a luxury that we'd only choose as a last resort. We need to work with planners, with building controllers and insurers, as well as convincing our clients that retrofit and reuse can be a good option. Not only do we need to engage with a wide group of stakeholders, we need to educate future professionals so that they both have in-depth learning and can engage with all the other disciplines. To quote Tim Eibel, who chairs the UK organisation which provides accreditation for the qualifications required to become a chartered engineer, the climate emergency must be central to our education of engineers. Professionalism and ethics must be integrated and nurtured within teaching and learning throughout students' engineering education. This has never been more important than in this era of the climate emergency and changing society, where an ability to make ethical decisions and a cultural confidence to simply say no in situations where ethics are judged to be violated are essential attributes of civil engineering graduates. I agree with him. We need to take up this challenge and come up with creative ways to engage with our stakeholders and to convince them, for example, that short span and low rise structures are okay, building and infrastructure need to be built to last for generations. We need to evaluate honestly how our buildings perform. We need to save, catalogue and reuse building demolition materials. We need to learn how to decouple increasing GDP from prosperity. This is really crucial. I could go on and on. So the challenge is to use our creativity and skills to produce good architecture and happy places for the long-term health of the planet. So let's please all sign up to Built Environment Declares. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Are there any questions from the audience? So there is a mic going to the audience, Jane. Okay. Okay, so I hope you can hear me. Thank you for your presentation. Um, one of the main topics of the FIB is um, to make a bridge between research and practice. Yeah. And I have the feeling that for the cement industry, that gap is even further. Yeah. There has been a lot of pressure uh, on some projects in Switzerland to use a sim 3 b coupled with recycled aggregated concrete. Uh, and we have been looking into that solution a lot, and we wanted to come up with something that is even more environmental friendly. <clears throat> However, when we, when we take a look at the literature of, um, of the cement technology, it seems to me that what is available in the market today doesn't reflect at all what uh, the state of the research is. In a way, we can... Um, we can gap this, we can close this gap between research and what is available uh, on our market and why it's taking so long mm. to make these products available. I agree with you. It's, it's a really knotty problem. I, we, that's why what we're going to try and do is get um, a round table um, discussion going actually in the next few weeks. I think we, we need to get the people who are doing the research um, to feel that they're in an environment where they can speak safely, we call it Chatham House Rules, to people who are doing manufacturing and designing and specifying. And we, need, um, and, and we need to really work out how to overcome those barriers. You're absolutely right. It's absolutely critical. And we're a long way away from it. So at the moment, it's, I think it's the, the most important thing. We've, you know, in, in the UK, and I'm sure it's true everywhere, we have people who supply ready mixed concrete who don't want to change the mix that they're sending out every day it's you know it's too expensive so somehow we need to we need so we need to get financial people involved as well to work out how how the economic economics of this can be done how to get in the insurance side of it sorted out because obviously if we're going to use new materials then clients are going to be risk averse so yes you're right that's it's a 
big problem. And that, that's why I think that organizations like the Edge are useful because, well, we're, we're unpaid. We've got, we don't have any um, obligation to anyone and we can just needle people, but we, we need to do this internationally as well. Um, so, uh, um, and, and in fact, I, you know, uh, we will be wanting to talk to organizations like yours. Great, thank you very much, Jane, for this answer. There is another question also in the audience. So there's a mic going towards the person. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Michal Wojniak from Schnetzer Puskas. Um, I've been doing some calculations for footprint recently, and actually it's very simple. As soon as you agree on the carbon factors and it's a very simple calculation. And when you know the um, the area of your research. That's why these notions of cradle to cradle, cradle to grave, and cradle to gate were introduced. So we must be very clear about the um, range of our uh, calculation. Uh, but then at the end, what matters is the overall effect. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask you about this uh, low and high rise mm -hmm. strategy, because I got asked questions very often. When you have a high rise, of course, it has a big impact, big gray energy, but the number of houses, like apartments you can put in there or offices is, is very big. If we were to put somewhere the same number of offices as a single buildings, I think the gray energy would be even higher than putting it all into one building. Or what is your opinion on that? I, I don't think that is the case. I mean, that. Um... Actually, if you look at the work that um, they have been doing at University College London, there's there's quite a lot of studies and they've be also been looking at other studies that have been done. So um, yes, if you put it all into one big building, that, that there's lots of problems. The buildings, if they go very tall, they have to get wider. So people are further away from the edge of the, of the building. So then you start needing um, uh, more, more light as you have taller buildings for the whole life of the building, you're lifting people and water up um, many, many floors. Um, also you have overshadowing effects. I mean, there are the, lots of other downsides to tall buildings anyway for residential in particular, for, um, because um, there's, you know, parents are, are, are very dislocated from their children if the children are playing at ground level. You can have some clever buildings which maybe have intermediate play areas or whatever, but it's much less efficient. And since you can get the same density with only going up say eight stories as, as going up 50 stories, why wouldn't you do that? Thank you, Jane. I think someone here in the front wanted to react to this. Just a moment until they bring the mic. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Uh, you had a sentence in the middle of your talk, your new constructions should last forever. Mm. Our, our situation is different. We have service life requirements. There is a real gap how, to, how we have to understand this. Thank you. I mean, people talk about design life um, and, they, and they're talking about lots of different things. One is just up, you know, as a structural engineers, we're just talking about the return period for the wind loads that we're calculating. And services engineers, they, you know, we, we know we will have to replace services, wiring, all those sorts of things quite often. But the actual structure, there's no reason why it can't last forever. We have got buildings that have been around for more than a thousand years, um, but they have to be maintained. We have to stop water ingress. Uh, you know, yeah, we'll have to insulate them if we haven't, but new buildings can be properly insulated. Uh, so if we design a building with the intention that it can be maintained and, and have the things that need to be replaced, replaced from time to time, you know, we, we're now designing our windows so they can be replaced from the inside, all sorts of things like that. So the, the costs of, of replacing the bits that need to be can come down. I, I just don't see why we can't have that as our, as our goal. And if, and you know, coming back to the point that Lee was discussing and questions were going to her about, um, about the loads that you should design floors for. I mean, I quite agree that we can't expect to have um, 
to turn a, a, um, a, um, a residential building into a sports pavilion. But offices to residential can easily switch back and forth. We've been doing it, but we're cutting ourselves out of the possibility of doing that with an awful lot of the housing that we're building at the moment, not just because of loading, because actually this loading is coming down anyway, especially if we're going paperless, but more to do with the fact that the spaces are ungenerous. The floor to ceiling heights that we're building in our, in our cheap residential blocks at the moment are going to be hopeless to be transferred into offices in the future. So we're, in this country, we're building masses of student housing and people say, oh, it doesn't matter if it's only single aspect or it's a bit unpleasant to be in that room because you're not there very long. But actually, we might not have 50 percent of the population going to university in 20 years time. And then we'll have families living in those those flats. So I think we need to be designing everything so that it can be as flexible and reusable as possible. Thank you, Jane. Uh, sorry, you wanted to react? I think there's one more question there. Yeah, now, we've seen how, how flexibility was very important in the COVID pandemic. So. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Philippe Nikitic. I work as a civil engineer in a uh, design office in Marge. And um, I had a follow-up question to the remark of Patrick uh, uh, with respect to why are we still not receiving the low uh, carbon uh, cement? from the industry. I remember during my PhD, it was 2016, it was a series of lectures about high-rise towers in New York. They were constructed. It was, I think, uh, Aurelio who was giving these lectures. And one of the questions was, how do you choose the material to build a high-rise tower? Do you go with steel or do you go concrete? Mm -hmm. And apparently a lot of buildings have been constructed in steel because at the time, uh, mafia was controlling the concrete industry business, so they just did not want to go for this material to not to stimulate uh, basically the, the financial. So isn't this maybe a way to think and to force them to, uh, to give us the product that we want? Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting your question as saying, really, we, it, we have to address this not just as technicians, we have to try to find the right politicians, the right economists, um, um, the, the, the right people who know what are the factors that are that are properly influencing what we spend our money researching and manufacturing. And that's why our education um, uh, of the next generation has to be, I think, quite radically rethought. And it, and it isn't, obviously we have to have great knowledge in depth and have to be able to do finite element analysis and all those sorts of things. But we also need to have these um, good linkages, I think, with, with, with other, other professions, other people. Um, you know, some, some universities are deliberately having a, um, a period of say six weeks where all the teaching is done across all the disciplines. I think this is fantastic. That's the sort of thing we, we need to start thinking about so that as, as those graduates grow up and become professionals, they'll know the right people to speak to and how to influence things. Great, thank you very much, Jane. Um, we're gonna try to uh, include you also in the discussion later on. Um, thanks for, uh, for the questions also. Um, it's interesting that you talked also about high-rise buildings because the next speaker is Bill Baker. Um, and uh, he's a structural engineer and a consultant oh, <laughs> at a firm of both architects and engineers, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, SOM in Chicago. And Bill enjoys working at various scales from the world's tallest man-made structure, the Burj Khalifa, uh, to small projects such as single family houses or small pedestrian bridges. He also frequently collaborates with artists such as Janet Eckelman, James Turrell, James Plenza, Inigo Manglano Ovale and others. His designs are frequently informed by his very active research efforts. A recent focus is the creation of visually based design processes that result in highly efficient structures. Bill also frequently lectures uh, and is currently teaching at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana and will be teaching in the new year at MIT and the University of Cambridge. Please join me in welcoming Bill. Okay. 
Anyway, uh, th uh, thank you very much. Uh, when we were uh, talking to the organizers about this particular session, uh, it was you know, behind the curtain, uh, the creative role of the structural engineer and architect in the 21st century. And, um, and so let's think about where we are today, where we are in the short term, and where we're in, in the long term, particularly for the younger people in, in this room who are gonna be around for most of the 21st century. The, um, you know, we're in a world that is changing very quickly. The, the creative role of the structural engineers and the architects in the remaining eight decades of this 21st century. And so let us explore that. Today, as Lee has discussed, there is a climate crisis. And I agree with her completely. It's the carbon we spend today is the most important. And, and so the least carbon we spend at this moment is, is because there's a knock on effect of the carbon you pay now in the environmental damage it does, which causes more environmental damage. The, uh, uh, you know, buildings need to be extremely efficient. Less is better. And I also think less is better in many ways. When you look at the beautiful work that we're, uh, we see here in Switzerland, the work of, of, of Maillard and Eastler and others, it was all about doing it for less. That, that the, the uh, design is a search for constraints and the constraints of efficiency and economy uh, can drive the need to be more clever. I think yesterday someone was talking about uh, more money does not make better architecture. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and I'm from Chicago where the rents are low. And so if you wanna, if you wanna have a nice lobby in your building, you, you better spend very little money on the structure because if you, if you spend too much on the structure, there's no money left over because you can only uh, get uh, so much in rent. And so, but, uh, but as we go down to doing with less, doing uh, less is better. We also have to have inspiration. It can't be, it can't be like hair shirt world where we're, we're living uh, uh, uninspired. And so it's, it's this, it's this uh, conflict between doing it with less, but also being inspirational at the same time. And I really do believe we can have both. Now, the other thing uh, that's of today is technology is changing everything. Uh, artificial intelligence and, and computational innovations are changing what can be done and what needs to be done by humans. Uh, new materials will create new uh, possibilities and new architecture, but most buildings will continue to be using existing materials and systems. And so in the short term, People in this room should be very, very busy because we have a climate crisis. Uh, you, you know, we need to be directing technology to improve designs, integrate systems, uh, construct, operate, and eventually repurpose uh, and reuse buildings, uh, develop new materials uh, that, 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 are, that are better. And, you know, and quite frankly, well, if you're gonna do a tall building, uh, why use all one material? Why not timber for the floors and steel for the beams and concrete for the columns? Uh, you know, every, every material where, where it's the most efficient uh, to, to be used. The, uh, uh, but, but soon over time, a lot of the stuff that even we're doing today will be taken over by computer. Uh, I'm not so sure about the hand sketches. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a great believer as we we're talking, Paul was talking the other day about uh, uh, doing design with hand sketches, you know, it's, it's, it's the connection of your, your brain to your ha hand to your pencil. And, and it's about simplifying the problem. Uh, uh, what I like to do when I do a, uh, a, a new design is to do it by hand because it makes me make the problem simple because I can't calculate something too complex. And it, and it drives to, to higher efficiency and more clarity of vision and more clarity of structure and architecture. Uh, but in the long term, uh, we're going to be in the post-human computational age. And all the young people here have to be really good on the box. You know, if you want to get a job, you got to be really good on the box. You got to do uh, Grasshopper and Rhino and all the fine element programs. But later in your career, humans will not be doing that through artificial uh, artificial intelligence the like, uh, you know, uh, these things will be kind of like happening. So what is your role? 
But this is the role of the architect and the, and the engineer in this post-human computational age. And, and so that re reminds me of the, the bader meinhof syndrome, okay? Uh, uh, this term came from, you know, the bader meinhof was a, a terrorist group in, in, in neighboring Germany. Uh, and uh, there was a journalist who had never heard of them. And then, they, then this journalist became aware of this group called Bader Meinhof. And then this journalist saw the name everywhere. It was always there in the press, but the, but the person never recognized it because it wasn't on, the, on their radar. It wasn't, and you see the same thing. You, uh, you, you buy a jacket, then all of a sudden you see everybody bought the same jacket, you know, and you were, it was always there, but you never saw it. And uh, I think that is what we, the, what the role of the, uh, of the architect and engineer is going to be in the future is recognizing and seeing what other, what is there for everyone to see, but they don't recognize. The, and and particularly on the structural engineers, I think it's a deep, deep understanding of theory of, of materials, of construction, of behavior or structures, that when they look at what is presented to everyone by these, uh, the post-human computational age, you'll see what is the essence on there. You'll recognize uh, what is there for everyone to see, but no one but you can, can, can recognize. In some ways, it's not unlike a senior architect or engineer in a firm where the junior architect uh, or engineer comes in with a solution and they just look at it and they see what's wrong or what to change and, and, and how, to, how to manipulate because they have that deep understanding. And I think that's what's gonna be very important. So if I were a young student today in engineering, I would take a lot of theory, theoretical classes because that has no shelf life. Uh, you'll use it for, for your entire career. The, um, but uh, even, uh, and part of this process is the why. Uh, in the future, I believe that, uh, that uh, these post-human computational things will, will propose solutions and and why that is the solution is much more important than what the solution is. It's that insight. It, it's why we need to know uh, when we see something that this is a, is, a, is a way to go because we understand in a deep manner. And, and that's why the why is much more important than what. And then we as designers can change the problem and, and, and go a different direction. So I've kept this a little brief. But, uh, and, and, and in my, the new world of less is, is, is better. Uh, my, my slides, I think, represent that. Just uh, uh, a less is better. So thank you. Thank you for this uh, uh, less is better slides <laughs> and, and, and talk. And, uh, and insights also for what uh, new generation engineers and architects should be learning. Uh, are there any questions about this on the audience? There is a question and a mic coming. I'd be interested to know um, what has been happening in your firm um, up till now recently to sort of bring AI, machine learning into design practice? Um, there's a, quite a bit actually going on. Uh, we're training the computer despite a seismic damage. A, a series of our structural engineers went down to the last big Mexico City earthquake and photographed all the buildings with all the, with all the damage. And they were able to train the computer to interpret the damage from the earthquake. Uh, we, we, have, we have trained uh, the computer to, to inspect rebar. That, that, you, that, you, uh, that the, you have a drone, it flies over the, the construction, it sees what's there, and the computer can then recognize if the rebar is in the right place, and they can even compare it to the shop drone. Uh, you know, uh, our firm has been around for a long time, and so we have a huge database of buildings that were built. We have a, 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 an initiative in the office right now where, where we're, we're, we're putting all, the, all, all the, the building cores into the system and seeing if we can train the, uh, uh, the computer to make an initial estimates on core layouts. And so life is changing. Uh, I can't say it's not scary because I think it is in some ways very scary because I, 
I mean, uh, when we're doing the Burj Khalifa, it was all about the core. The, the architects would propose a core and we say, no, that doesn't work for us. And we would redraw the core and give it back to them. And they say, well, that doesn't work for me. And then they'd redraw it and give it back. And it takes about, I don't know, six, eight weeks to work out the core, you know, proposal, counter proposal. And it's, it's stressful, but actually a lot of fun, but, you know, to, to, to have this, this dialogue with your colleagues, so, you know, as you try to get something that, that works for everyone, it, everyone has to make something that will compromise. And to not be able to, to have some computer spit out an answer is a little frightening to me. Uh, and that's why you need to know the why and not just the what. So when it gives you an answer, you say, well, that's not, it, it missed the point, you know, because I know something that, that it, it didn't know. But yeah, uh, think this is coming fast. If I may just follow up with, with uh, another question, let's take the example of inspecting rebar that you talked about. Are you sufficiently confident in your AI that you will take the results of the AI and just go with them? Or do you have some human intervention to, to check that? Well, currently now, of course, we're checking it. I mean, it, this is in developmental stages. And, and so it's like, uh, you know, I mean, we're kind of shocked at how good it's doing, all right? Uh, but, uh, but no, you, uh, but at some point, yeah, there has to be that quality control where, uh, you know, like, uh, was it, um, uh, the Tesla self-driving cars where they, they, they sometimes hit somebody or hit mm -hmm. something, you know, and, um, you know, even though there's a person in the, in the, in the cockpit, um, yeah, no, it, it'll be a bit of time, but you know, it's, it, you know, we're in a changing world that's changing very rapidly. Thank you for these questions. Um, if there's no more questions, we, we might go to the next speaker and I'm sure there will be more questions in the discussion okay. later. Okay. Thank you. Um, so our last speaker is Eli Mosayebi and the close connection between practice, research and teaching uh, is really key in the career of Eli Mosayebi. Since 2004, she has led the Zurich-based architecture office Edelaar Mosayebi Interbitzin, together with Ron Edelaar and Christian Interbitzin. They won numerous projects through competitions, and in these projects, housing and urban design have a special significance. From 2004 to 2008, she was a research assistant in the chair of architecture theory under Professor Akos Moravansky. And since 2018, she has held the position of professor for architecture and design at ETH Zurich. Housing and the change it currently is undergoing is really an integral aspect of the work, both in practice and in research of Eli Mosayebi. Please join me in welcoming her. So much for having me and I'm really pleased to be part of this wonderful symposium. <laughs> so, some of the aspects that you have been mentioning, I'm going to repeat, but I'm an architect, so I'm going to talk more about a new ecological aesthetics in architecture that needs to be approached. So in, I start with a quote. In 2020, human-made artificial material equaled the weight of all life on Earth, continuing to accumulate by 30 billion tons a year. By 2040, manufactured materials will weigh twice as much as life on Earth. The majority of this anthropogenic mass originates from the construction industry, where concrete, gravel, asphalt, and metals contribute significantly. As human-made materials continues to accumulate, so does waste. By 2025, we will be producing 2.2 million tons every year, of which half is from the construction industry. So our use of resources and the accumulation of waste are a product of modernity. In pre-industrial times, when raw materials were expensive and manual labor cheap, there was minimal domestic or construction waste thanks to well-functioning reutilization and recycling systems. It was not until industrialization the belief in a constantly growing economy and the mass consumer society that exploitation of resources accelerated to the degree that made the current development possible. 
the exploitation of resources is directly linked to waste production. The more we mine and extract, the more waste we generate. Despite the significant environmental impact and the approaching depletion of our resources, we still live the life, the ideal of modernity, an ideal of the ever new, an apparent purity and perfection, a life without time and transience, an ideal of durable and yet timeless architecture. In the architecture of a second modernity, we at our chair ask what architecture evolves out of a pre-owned out of the pre-owned and old, the impure and repaired, the reused and the recycled. But architectural aesthetics emerge when we strive for an ecological durability, where durability and sustainability are not in conflict. We are convinced that numerical comparisons alone will not be enough to bring about a change in thinking. You know, I mean, how many trans transatlantic flights you can actually fly to equal a bridge. What is needed are suggestive, suggestive aesthetically challenging examples that reveal that the new ecological aesthetic has qualities of its own. Concrete, for example, is a durable material, you know that. It's, uh, and it's probably the most frequently mentioned material when it comes to naming the environmental impact of construction. The production of concrete requires raw materials such as gravel, sand and water. The production of cement is still causes, of course, 5% of global CO2 emissions. Currently, there are approaches that reveal how concrete can be pulverized again and reused as gravel substitute, but it doesn't really reduce CO2 emissions. What is surprisingly studied far too little is the direct reuse of the militian concrete. Concrete could be mined like natural stone in a quarry by means of a diamond saw or a water jets. A similarly sized stone block could be directly recovered uh, common components. We investigated this approach in a student project last semester. The city of Zurich was their quarry. The students assumed that they would mainly reuse floor slabs as well as staircase or elevator cores. This also explains the geometry of the L-shaped walls, which are corners of a cut core. It is clear that such reused components can only be loaded in compression. Additional tension cables and steel beams are used to tie the elements together, both horizontally and vertically stabilizing the blocks against horizontal forces. Concrete is commonly associated with robustness, durability, and solidity, especially in the Swiss building culture, which is highly concerned with the question of durability. We also ask, can there be other ideas for durable solutions? In one, another project, we investigated how a lightweight construction material without concrete can be made durable by means of continuous maintenance and care through regular oiling, for example, of the timber, the surface of the wood hardens and transforms with time um, into a long lasting surface. Finally, in our pavilion at Münsterhof that was just built last week, we show that in a circular construction, the materials are more durable than the construction. Concrete Lego blocks for ballasting, steel sta scaffolding and textiles are dismantled after a short time and will be reused in another form in future. So I think we are in an extremely challenging but also exciting time and really we need to embrace this moment to come up with new solutions for a new architecture and engineering. Thank you. Thank you, Eli, also for uh, questioning also how we look at buildings, really, uh, and this uh, aesthetics of uh, reuse, for example. Are there any questions from the audience? Are there any questions from online, actually? I'm, I, I didn't really... Oh, there, there. All right. Well, I guess I, I, there is a question. So 
No, Martin Hoberg. Um, are you cooperating with material science at ETH uh, when it comes to uh, splitting strengths to compressive strengths and what that entails for the um, uh, usability or for, for, for the uh, utility uh, level of usage of member, members to forces? Not with material sciences, but with engineers. We are collaborating at ETH and we are also um, um, kind of, the, I, maybe I have to say that that's maybe also the, the beginning of a research that uh, should be also then turned into concrete prototypes to, uh, in order to really find out what kind of aesthetics might might be developed. But but yes, we are actually all the semesters in, uh, we are doing, we are having collaborations with engineers, but also with artists. Yes. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, can you just explain a bit more the, um, the slide in which you reuse the course of the concrete course as, uh, as elements? Because the sketch was a bit, uh, yeah, it was a bit noisy. Can you just explain a bit more so what we are looking at here? It, it was thank a you. simple thought, you know, because um, when we, we did a semester on material flow, a love semester, and we had all these concrete guys coming into our semester and giving lectures about how you can pulverize concrete and reuse it again. And then you have this flow called recycling concrete, but turned out that, you know, you actually don't reduce CO2 emissions when you use that. So we thought it might be more interesting to go directly to the building components and use actually concrete with, uh, of buildings that is going to be um, um, torn down or dismantled. And we are going to cut the course because they have a lot of um, strengths into in these L-shaped um, um, walls, and we're going to put them actually in, in a way, you can see it maybe in the axonometry, that would keep, let's say, a space out of three meters to 12 meters um, long. In order to horizontally stabilize it, we would come up with beams, you see that it's steel beams on the side, on the edges, and we would come up with um, tension cables uh, on the surface of the slabs to, to, to make it also stiff. And that was actually only the start of a discussion with students I had, but I thought it was, on one hand, I, I think it's, it's, it's a possible pause to think further, it's just a start. But on the other hand, I also liked very much the fact that it makes the reused elements visually um, sensible, no? and also makes sense to the future um, inhabitants of this building that they see how that has been constructed and built and it somehow will create a certain, let's say, um, participation of this future user that they know where these elements come from and it, it even becomes maybe an ornament of a future, I don't know, of kind of a future usage. So I, I like that very much and I also think that um, you know, that we should come up with new aesthetics to, to create a kind of a more, let's say, communal responsibility towards those questions, because it's not only we as architects or engineers that are responsible for this change, but we need also to invite the actual clients or users of this architecture to be involved in it. And by making it visible, we may be um, on a better track. Did you have some exchange with the offices who are doing the demolishing? Because I, I can imagine that the demolishing process has a huge financial impact also on this. How do they actually, are, do they actually cut it like this? No, or? no, they don't. Actually, yeah. they, I, I mean, in, the we know it, but that's the problem. They have, you know, when you invite those guys, or if you talk, when you talk to these guys, they always um, want to impress you with their big machines they have. So that the smaller the construction site or the deconstruction site is, the more bothered they are because they cannot use their big machines, no? So here they need to go, like in, a, in, like in a quarry, they need to go with the diamond saw and look at this material as precious material and to cut it carefully. And this, of course, is a huge economical question. I'm totally aware of that. And that's the reason why it's not done so far. But if we would change that, no, and if we would see value even in existing material structures, then we maybe change also or create a shift towards the evaluation of those um, all buildings, no? They are quarries. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I find it very interesting that we already had a few talks which are speaking about reusing materials, <laughs> such as you, such as Neven, is the idea of uh, modular, modular building and uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday about the stadium. So 
I'm glad to see uh, some ideas pushing towards this direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, no, I, no, let's wait for the mic. Uh, and you don't have to ch shout. Quick question. Do you think there are geographic boundaries to this discussion? Yes, I think so, yes. I think so we've been in contact with Rotor, for example, but also other firms we know that do that actually already. But when we invite them and ask how does it actually work in, a, let's say, in reality, then you realize that um, the, that kind of, let's say, the building economy in a place is quite local and it's not easily scalable or trans, trans, translatable into our context. So that's, that's somehow there are some boundaries. And I also think that, you know, if you look at the city as a quarry, you don't, I mean, it doesn't make actually any sense to kind of drive around Europe with, with cars of, of material, but the, the aim must be to remain as local as possible. So maybe I misworded myself when I said <clears throat> geographic boundaries, I meant at a global scale, because the environmental crisis and emergency will actually be based for the large part on parts of the world that are not urbanized. Yes. So there is no fabric to reuse. There is no demolition to make. And these are parts of the world that need new construction to get out of poverty. And so how does one apply this particular train of thought? No, it's, it's, it's an important question. And of course I cannot answer that today, but um, you just need to know that for example, a city like Zurich is going to grow by hundred thousand people in the next two, um, until 2040. So there is a big speculation already going on. And the question is, where does the material actually come from? No? And of course, you can also say maybe it's like that, that maybe by 2046, we have reached a rare peak of population and it's going to decrease again afterwards. That might happen also. And taking that into account, we, we need to build in, in a European context or in a Swiss context that I stem from in a way that maybe these, these buildings are you know, the material is more durable than the building itself, for example. There's one more question there. Um, I have also one question. I mean, you have also great practice in Zurich. Uh, and um, I would like to ask you how these teams influence your practice. I mean, there is so many apartments that you are building in the city mm -hmm. and i think for the audience could be very interesting if you can give us a few comments thank you for uh, this question no that, that's a really good one and and in practice in reality it's extremely extremely hard to convince the clients to actually do that so for example there is a competition brief and it says i mean the word sustainability you can read that maybe 20 times in a brief of 20 pages no and then you really mean it seriously. So you, for example, don't tear down the whole estate to replace it with new buildings, but you maybe tear down just a part or you put it on the existing um, uh, parking lots on the ground. For example, these are all um, actually suggestions we made and, and then it would not pass. I mean, we just, we just keep on trying, we do that actually, but um, I have the feeling that practice is just not ready, they just, you know, they want to have the, they want to greenwash themselves with these labels, but actually when it comes to actual discussions, they are extremely hesitant and they are afraid. You know? They are afraid that it won't sell as well. They're afraid of, I don't know, smaller apartments, less quality and these kind of questions. But, but still, I mean, we are not giving up. And, and I think my chance at, with this position at ETH is to actually prove that it could be feasible and that on an aesthetic level, it's maybe also very beautiful, you know, and suggestive. And it's something that maybe expresses our time much better than, than maybe the, the buildings that look like 10 years ago. No? So that's something that I like to do. And I, some of the clients, of course, they, they change now, but it's, it's really slow. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there's a question over there. And then in the meantime, I, I would like to invite the other speakers to come back to the stage so that we can start the debate as well. And I would invite also questions from the audience to any one of the speakers. Uh, is there, I think, yeah, well, we can start there now that the mic is there and I'll come to your question afterwards. Hello, uh, a little question. 
do you don't think that architects and engineers have to, to, to do more politics? We don't have people, technical people in politics. And I think that is the, 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 the problem. Yes, it, it, is, it would be important to have more, yeah. more power in politics. I think there are some, some politicians are quite aware of it, but it always, you know, it doesn't really match what is actually happening out there in reality. Yes, I think there is somebody here, but... There is someone that has been waiting for a while there with the, the question. Yeah, I wanted to, so the, la the last pavilion that you showed, it was very obviously designed for uh, to be deconstructed because also it's a temporary pavilion, right? So it uh, makes sense. Um, but do you also, in your, in your housing projects, do you also envision that they should be designed for this assembly? Um, and do you also actually practice that in the, in the buildings that, you, that you're making? Thank you for this question. Yes, there is actually one client that really wants to do that now. But I, we had to give the fact, you know, the proof through these kind of academic projects and to kind of come up with these ideas and these new narratives. You no, know, it's also important. And, and there is just the first client who really wants to do it now and we start. But it's just the beginning, yeah. And I think the more prototypes and the more examples are being built, the more it becomes the new normal. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. Ali, I, I will invite yeah, you to sit sorry, with us. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think there's another question over there. Um, Speaking for the Swiss Engineers and Architects Association, we do have the, the price uh, Umsicht regards. Did you ever try to utilize that to, to um, make your ideas more widely known and your solutions? Or should we have in Switzerland a different competition, different price? for this kind of, of, of construction? You know, at, at, at the moment, uh, the problem is not that you are not seen with us, this, this kind of ideas. I think it's, it's very well on the table. And if, you, I mean, I, I don't think that that is the problem. The problem is really that there are too few prototypes or too few buildings that actually prove the fact that it's really possible. You know, that's, that's, I think, something that still needs to be translated. As a concept, it's it's absolutely feasible. It's not, but it's not there yet. You were talking about lack of acceptance by, from, from, from the side of clients. Yes. And I thought that the price of competition for this kind of decomposable buildings and reusable uh, members that that might be worthwhile um, publishing and because and you know the, the lack of acceptance comes with legal problems. It becomes with uh, higher prices. And so on. So it's it's a it's a complex thing that you have to kind of convince the clients with because he re, he or she really has to be convinced of a ecological problem, and then they want to. But it's 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 not just yeah, but an if, acceptance. If, if you without... think of the Olympic Museum in Lausanne, I, that contributed rather to their image, the building of the of the price they they earned uh, for, for for reusing windows of broken down mm -hmm. houses and so when they built building the Olympic Museum in Lausanne, mm -hmm. so the image may counter the or uh, the, the the higher price. Do you want to? Um... I, I think we can continue this discussion. Sure. I I just want to interrupt a little bit because uh, Bill just mentioned that he wants to answer the question that Paolo just asked about the geography. Well, I, I thought the question about geography was very important. The problem is not in Switzerland. The problem is going to be in Africa and, and China and Southeast Asia, where the huge growth is going to be. And just like uh, places like that, they, they skip the, the landline and they go straight to the cell phone. Uh, uh, here in, in, in the developed Europe, We've already gone through all these generations of development of technology. Can we then take the best and, and, and help them skip all, this, all the steps we had to make to get to where we are so that the construction, because the population growth are, are there and, and, the, and then the construction growth is there. And can we save the environment in Switzerland 
by decreasing the carbon production in these other parts of the world, by exporting the, the, the technology, the research that you all are doing to there so that when they build their, you know, uh, as they urbanize and build their cities, they do it with much less than what we have done here. Uh, you, you know, and then, um, uh, you know, Jane was also talking about, you know, the reuse, how you don't want to get everything so tight that you can't reuse it for the next thing. And, and so studies like that, where, you know, I'm all for uh, less is better, but that's, uh, there's a phrase in the US, you, you can make a, a pizza so cheap that no one will ever eat it, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, we have to, we have to you know, balance, you know, how low can we go and still have a good, something that's desirable and, and do this uh, for these developing worlds. Thank you, thank you. I think Jane also wants to add something to the, yeah, I'd, I'd like to go back to that previous uh, question that Ellie was um, asked, um, and it, it's not exactly the same, but I, I think that project of um, Lacaton and Vassal, uh, where, where they persuaded the, the client that it would be a good idea to add the extra layer um, of kind of winter gardens and uh, area which also served as insulation to those slab blocks. Um, what they were really clever about was putting together the economic argument so that the tenants didn't have to pay more because um, they actually ended up getting more area and, and but, that, but, but they didn't have to pay more rent. And that's what I was kind of alluding to in, in, our, in our discussion about how we should be educating the next generation. We need, we need to really be educating ourselves to be more savvy about those commercial and legal arguments. And there are also gonna be insurance arguments that we've got to come to terms with. I think. Hello. Um, this is a discussion I had with a few people over the, the, the last day and uh, it kind of uh, connects with this economic question, but, but there's one thing that I find super bothersome with the way our industry works is if I design a building that's going to be heavier and, and, and more expensive, I'm actually going to get paid more as a designer because my fees are linked to the construction cost. So the, the way all of our industry is set up is that we really have no incentive to, to go that way from a financial point of view. And, and to me, it's kind of clear that, that the only way we can get out of this is that we link the savings that we make to the fees that we're getting paid. And this is not just going to be us as structural engineers, but some of it has to go to the architect, some of it has to go to, to the construction firms. But we somehow have to get all together in a boat where the more we put effort in, the more time we put in, and the better we get, the more we get from it. Otherwise, I just don't see this going in the right direction. I mean, this is a really, it's a really good Share that or have other thoughts on that part. Uh, well, we have a different fee structure. So. <laughs> Maybe you're... But, 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 but it has the same result. Uh, generally, uh, a conservative design is less labor than an efficient design. And if you have a fixed fee, then you make more money if you're wasteful mm -hmm. in, in the product. It, so it, it is a big problem. I, you know, I think it's just, just having required a reporting of embodied carbon on every project, you know, and, and, um, and maybe fees related with some inverse scale mm -hmm. uh, would be helpful. Because yeah, there, there does need to, as, you know, as Jane knows, uh, you know, the commercial aspects, I mean, we, we can be brilliant on our technology, but if we, you have, the market will drive what we actually do in reality. I think there's some. Okay, J Jane wants to answer to that as well. I just, um, just want to point out that, you know, the, the, the um, services engineers have been through this because of course, um, that therefore used to be related to how much kit they put in buildings. But now that they, they have actually persuaded clients to, to pay them in a different way so that um, it's, it, their fee is not related to the amount of kit they put in. So it can be done, we can change this, uh, but we, we, you're right, we have to band together. We need to do it through our institutions um, and, and, and we need to do it collaboratively amongst all of the professional institutions. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, 
we have to collaborate. That's really true. Um, I think there are some questions from the audience again. So I yes, um, a question to Bill Baker. Uh, could you explain the the collaboration between architect and engineer at SOM, and also the evolution that you see of this collaboration? Um, okay, um, as, you know, as my firm Skidmore and Zamero, called it SOM. Uh, it, it was uh, founded by two architects and an engineer. Uh, you know, Skidmore was a design architect, Owings was a design management architect, and Merrill was an engineer. And, and this was the um, tradition in Chicago. All of the firms were architectural engineering firms. Uh, Adler, the famous Adler and Sullivan firm, Adler was the engineer, Sullivan was the architect. And Frank Lloyd Wright, who used to work in the office, said all the clients were actually Adlers. If they wanted Adler, they had to take Sullivan. Uh, you know, and so there was this tradition, but so um, at SOM, we, uh, a, a project comes into the office, it, it, this doesn't always happen this way, but it's, it's, it's our goal. Um, we all get together, we get the, um, the uh, uh, you know, the uh, design architects, the technical architects, the structural engineers, the mechanical engineers, the plumbing engineers, electrical engineers, the sustainability uh, experts and engineers, uh, landscape uh, interiors, everyone's in the room. And, and, and so uh, they'll say, okay, we have a new project. There'll be some junior architect who, who lays out the, the parameters. Uh, you know, here's the city, here, here are the zoning rules and the construction rules. Here's where the mass transit lines are. Uh, and uh, here's the program the client wants. And, and at that point, nothing's been drawn that you would call design. And everybody throws out ideas. I, I usually comment on landscape architecture, okay, for some reason. Anyway, uh, so, uh, you, you know, everyone throws out ideas and then you maybe you make like uh, seven schemes, one which will be driven by maybe a structural idea. Another scheme might be driven by a, a sustainability idea or, or, you know, one is urban planning idea. And then you'll have these schemes and you look at them all and then you'll maybe go from, you'll marry some of these ideas and you'll come down with maybe you know, five schemes and then, go another round and then three schemes. Then you go to the client and, and, and bring them into the design process. Uh, and, uh, and in that, in that process, you know, it's, uh, it is the, it is the design architect who's kind of the orchestra leader, you know, you know pulling all this together. Uh, but, uh, but uh, we try very hard for all voices to be heard. And, and that we, and, and of course, you know, buildings are very complicated. It's a, uh, so search for, for the right compromise. No one gets the perfect answer for their discipline, but, but you, you do try to find a, 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 what is the best for the project. Um, and so, you know, that, that, is, that is the process. And uh, you know, I, I grew up sitting next to an architect, you know, and, um, and so, uh, you know, and, and being young and socializing together, you know, you know you're going to somebody's apartment, you know, uh, are, are going going to uh, Grant Park and listen to the concert, or whatever together is you know the socialization of the disciplines is very uh, you know very good and uh, and and very rewarding for, for I think all of us. And you might say we're also a self-selecting group. Uh, we're a bunch of uh, architects who like working with engineers, and a bunch of engineers who like working with architects. Because if you don't, you leave the firm. The evolution. The what? And the evolution of that, do you see well, evolution? Well, it's always been true. Uh, occasionally, I mean, part of it, uh, the, the evolution over time, it's actually gotten more and more pure. Uh, I mean, at one time, the, even the architecture was a bit split, where you might have the design architects and the, then the production architects, and they'd be like in different departments. But now that they're all blended together, uh, you know, and, um, and when an architect starts with the firm, they're, they're not one or the other, that they're just an architect. And then later they, they kind of specialize in, 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 into, uh, into something. Uh, uh, so some of our evolution has been more on the, shall I say, the, the design side. Uh, a few years ago, uh, SOM had done a very good building, but it should never have been done by SOM, <laughs> okay? It wasn't within our, our, our philosophy. And so all, all the design partners got together and I'm considered a design partner. And uh, we met in Philip Johnson's glass house in Connecticut. And we talked about what it is the firm is about. And at the end of the day, we came out that an S1 building should have one or all three, three things. Um, simplicity, which is neither good or bad, but it's what we like. Uh, structural clarity, 
and uh, sustainability. And, and so, you know, that, that that has to be kind of the guiding thing for it to, to be a building that comes from our shop. And, and for another firm, it could be a, another set, set of thing, but you know, uh, we're a firm that's been around over 80 years. And so how do you, how do you not wander off the path? You have to sometimes re-anchor yourself. Great, thank you. I, I think there is another question over there as well. So there is also a question from, I'm here. There is a question from the audience online, Lads Blaker is asking to Bill just to follow up on what you just said. Up until now, artificial intelligence has mostly been applied in areas where the objectives are very clearly defined. And while in the conceptual design of structures, there are objectives we can clearly quantify, such as embodied carbon and costs, there are also many that we cannot. With that in mind, is it realistic for artificial intelligence in the near future to be aware of all the complex objectives and requirements that are involved in the conceptual design phase? Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but all I can say is that what I've seen from architectural intelligence gives me great pause. You know, it says, I see it doing things I never imagined it could do. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's not, you know, the, the, the things which are the hardest to do are the uh, pure conceptual design uh, and, the, uh, and the, uh, the aesthetics, you know, the, uh, that little special thing that, that makes it uh, from, from a building to architecture. Uh, and so, you know, will it pick that up? I don't know. Uh, and and so um, I think it's 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 uh, something that's going to wait and see, but I think it's going to happen quick, more quickly than we than we think. And uh, and and will the will the designs that it produce are soulless, you know? And, and you need the you need the, the design team to put the soul back in. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know it is interesting um, uh, when um, I think it's over here on one of the tables. Uh, th there's a little chart of, of, of different systems, you know, like a wheel of different uh, structural systems and, and solutions, you know, and a lot of times when I'm working on initial design, I'll, I'll think about, you know, I'll, I'll sit there and think about, it, and I think, okay, now what am I, what have I not thought about? And, and I'll look at a chart like, oh, I didn't look at, I didn't look at that particular system. Let me, what, how would I apply that to here? Uh, will, will that already have been done in the, in the exhaustive thing? Um, but uh, for, for, for now, uh, I'm very happy just to say I can I can pull out my uh, where's my lead holder. <laughs> so you know I can pull out my lead holder and do it now by hand. Uh, you know, so this is this is uh, this is the artificial intelligence right now is the is the is the sketch, and I hope that stays for a while. But uh, I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Thank you. Uh, it's a question for all the panel. Um, before, uh, Tulia Lori said that we live in Instagram engineering right now. Do you think we are losing the battle in Instagram? Like the clients now, they, the people that decide, usually they are not engineers or architects and they tend to, to pick the trendy designer of the moment and they don't care if he's the cheapest or if what they build is good or not, in my opinion, at least. Well, the thing is, do you think we, we have to fight that battle in Instagram and social media in general or, or and go to the ground and explain people so people will demand their, their councils to do the things right or, or not? And it's for all the panel, no, just Billy Baker. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think this also ties a bit to, to what we were discussing earlier also about how we view buildings, right? Um, how, how do we look at buildings and especially the decision makers, right? That's if I understood your question correctly, like the decision makers are not specifically the ones who understand exactly how a building is. Yeah, I, I am and, aware that there are some councils that they just want to have the last the trendy designer. I am not going to say his name. Uh, in the city, so they make a monument that is totally expensive, and and just to have that 
if people demand in social media and seems to have more environmental friendly designs and things. So it's because of that. That ties a bit to, to the discussions we had also uh, earlier or yesterday, I think, about like what is architecture and how do we view buildings? I don't know if you, any of you wants to answer to that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I took a slightly different aspect from what you just said. And I mean, you mentioned Instagram and, and I take it as social media in, in general. And, and the trend I'm seeing is that the people we design for have, have much more easy access now to, to information as they may be used to. And so, I mean, it's the same as when you go to a doctor that that, comf that kind of trust relationship mm -hmm. that is shifting there. I also think we see it in our profession. I think clients, feel at least that they can be questioning much more or suggesting their own ideas because the access has gotten so much easier. But I would say this is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because in the end, that's the people we design for. And as Bill was saying, you know, our deep technical specialist knowledge is maybe even more needed now than it has ever been before. So I personally don't see it as a threat. I see it as a bit more of an exchange that we can have with the people we design for. Um, but I know this can sometimes be very frustrating as well with, with architects I, I work with who say, well, the, the clients come with ideas that challenge us. And this of course is a different, different relationship that you have as you maybe had before. So I don't know if you think no, about I, that. But I, I agree, it's, I mean, what we do have, what you have said, because you know, clients rarely come with formal ideas. You know, they come with somehow you know needs, which is totally fine, and or, or they want to be particularly sustainable. That would be also super, and and we would embrace that. And it's not that they come again with a certain material, with a certain form, so maybe material. That's the most what what they would come with. And I think as architects, you, you are used to this kind of openness and then you, your task is to translate that into a form, into space, no? And there, of course, then you have discussion on plans and so on, but of course, there is a certain limitation also in conveying that because of course, you know, plans and models and so on, it's, it's always limited in, in a certain way. But, um, I think in, in a way, I, I, I also don't find the current time particularly threatening. I find it actually quite interesting and it's, it's really a shift, you know, as, as people are more interested in where the food comes from, where let's say the clothes comes from, they're also extremely interested now in where the material actually comes from. No, that's, that's a super interesting shift that we have to acknowledge. And, you know, when you are on a construction site, when we are at our own construction site, we actually don't know where the material comes from. It's, you know, we just we order the product, but we don't know, no? Because these things that are not labeled and, and there is somebody selling it to us. So I think if, if there is really, a, kind of if, if you mean this shift in an honest way, you really should also go beyond what is happening at the moment and also include those questions. Great, thank you very much. I unfortunately uh, have to finish this debate because we're a bit running over time. But I hope that this was giving you some insights about um, our speaker's thoughts on what could make sense and what could <laughs> give purpose to your uh, profession as a structural engineer or as an architect and how we can view buildings and the profession in the future. Thank you very much. And thanks to the speakers and thanks for your questions. <laughs>